about the end of the chapter. Uh, Stephen covered Paul's conversion last week. I think you know, I felt like he, he did a good job. We're going to let it let it sit with that. There's some other things that go on with Paul. Uh, after that, he comes to faith in Christ. He then goes, and this is just kind of the setup for, for where he is. He goes on and he's healed. Um, Ananias, who he goes to, not the same Ananias from Ananias and Sapphira, okay, because that Ananias is dead. Um, but this one is there, and uh, he goes and has to be the person, and there's probably an entire sermon with Ananias early in, in chapter 9 that you can talk about the challenge when God calls him. Because God has healed Saul, or God has, God has healed Saul from his spiritual blindness and left him with his physical blindness. But nobody else knows that Saul's come to faith in Christ yet. And so Ananias gets this message that says, from the Lord that says, Go see Saul. And Ananias is like, I don't want to go to prison. This guy's mean. Every new believer needs somebody willing to sit with them and help them understand what it is to see Jesus. No matter how far they have come from. And sometimes we make mistakes as churches, as Christian people, when we look at somebody and say, well, I don't know, he was an awful bad fellow. I don't know if he, if, if well, I don't know if his salvation is real or not. Let's just sit back and wait a couple of years and let's see if there's anything real to it. And then after a couple of years, we end up looking and saying, well, he never got involved in church and he never really grew as a disciple. It must not have been real. And yet what he actually encountered was that every person who was a disciple said, I'm just going to take a wait and see approach. No, Jesus didn't wait to take a wait-and-see approach with any of us. He got right up in the middle of everything. But we're going to move on forward from that one. Then Barnabas shows up. Barnabas is there to encourage Saul as he grows. But we're going to move on from Barnabas as well. We're going to go to verse 32. Now, as Peter was traveling around from place to place, the Acts moves back to Peter as the focus. If you study the book of Acts, you'll see that there's a lot of time that is focused on Peter, and the rest of the time is focused on Paul. And for those of you hippies, no, we don't have any missing chapters where it's focused on Mary. All right, it's Peter and Paul, not Peter, Paul, and Mary. Some of y'all from the 60s know that one. The rest of y'all are trying to pretend like you don't. But when we when I preach out of Ecclesiastes 3, I see your mouth under your breath, turn, 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 in the middle of that, so don't even. That's Peter. So we're back to Peter as the focus. As, as the center point of the action. Peter was traveling around from place to place. He also came down to the saints who lived in Lydda. He found there a man named Aeneas who had been confined to a mattress for eight years because he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Get up! Make your own bed. And immediately he got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. So first we get this story, and it just seems kind of a little bit of a one-off. You just have this moment, Peter's traveling around, he encounters a guy who's paralyzed. He's become a paralytic as an adult because he's referred to as a man that says he's been paralyzed for eight years. So if he had been a boy, it would have said that. So we know this is a change in his life that has, that has hit him. Something has happened. Peter goes in, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, strengthens him, heals him of his paralysis. He's able to get up and demonstrate that by simply getting up and making his own bed. Get up. Start taking care of your own needs. And people hear about it. And they, they would have known, and this is why it says that, that it says that, that everybody around began to turn to the Lord. Realize that's kind of a social everybody. It's not that every person became a believer, but rather it's just that it started to be famous. That God was at work. Now, in Joppa, verse 36, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which in translation means Dorcas. By the way, that 
One of those is Greek, one of those is, is Aramaic, and they both mean uh, gazelle or deer, by the way. So, why she, you, you, don't, you don't name too many people in you know, Arkansas, Tabitha or Dorcas, because the deer is not a safe name. She was continually doing great good deeds and acts of charity. At that time, she became sick and died. When they had washed her body, they placed it in an upstairs room. Because Lydda was near Joppa, when the disciples heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him and urged him, Come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they brought him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, crying and showing him the tunics and other clothing Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all outside, knelt down, and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, get up! When she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her get up. Then he called the saints and widows and presented her alive. This became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. So Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a man named Simon, who was a tanner. So here's just a couple of moments where God, through Peter, heals first Aeneas and then raises uh, Tabitha from the dead. Now one reason that I think that Luke, when he writes Acts, picks up this story about Tabitha and makes sure that you get it is, it, it, it seems kind of familiar, doesn't it? There's a story in Luke where Jesus goes in and heals and raises a young girl who has died. And in fact, he records in the gospel what Jesus said to the girl in Aramaic, and it sounds a lot like Tabitha, but he uses the term for little girl, which is Talitha. So it's just one of those little points where Luke, is going, where Luke when he's write, writing both of these books, he is highlighting throughout the book of Acts that Jesus is not done working. This is why he picks up so many echoes of what Jesus did in the Gospels when he puts it in the work and, and sees it in the work of the apostles in the book of Acts. <laughs> it's because one of Luke's main points in the Acts of the Apostles is that God didn't quit. Here we've got Aeneas, who's on a mattress, paralyzed and unable to move. Like the guy at the pool of Bethesda who can't get to the water in time. And Peter tells him what? Get up, pick up your mat, and go. Oh wait, that's what Jesus told the guy at the pool of Bethesda. Peter tells this guy, get up, pick up your mattress, clean up your bed, go on about your life. Luke is reminding us in the scriptures here, he is reminding us that God didn't quit. See, it'd be real easy to pick up that half, that thought, because you see the, the work of Jesus throughout, throughout the Gospels. And you see him going and, and doing this and doing that. And then he's crucified, dying for our sins, which is great and glorious. That's where our forgiveness comes from. Then he raises from the dead, and then he's seen a few times. Although Paul will later tell us just how many times he's seen. And then he ascends to the right hand of the Father. And on the one hand, the message of the apostles initially is that this same Jesus that you saw go up, that they, as they were told, will come back in judgment. Jesus has promised them, and he's promised us that he's going to come back someday. But throughout the book of Acts, the message is but God isn't taking a vacation in that time frame. We sometimes feel that way. We sometimes act that way, as if the Lord God Almighty has said, well, I did this, I did, I did the, the, the virgin birth, and I did the sinless life, and, and, and I died, I did the crucifixion, I did the resurrection, I did the ascension. And now, break time. There'll be nothing else happen at my hand from now until I come back. So you just, everybody just lay out till Revelation ends. Or, you know what, church folks, it's good that you believe in me. You're on your own till Revelation ends. But that's just not true. 
No, sometimes we act like it and we live like it is. Well, I, you know, I just got to solve my own problems. Why would you have to solve your own problems? Is not the Almighty God of the universe said, I'll never leave you or forsake you? Well, we got to figure out what we're going to do as a church. You know, here's this marketing expert, and here's, here's this, and what if we did this, and what if we did that? Has not the Lord God himself called us as a church to him? Did he not give us instructions about what we ought to do? Did Jesus not say, by this, will all men know you're my disciples by your love for one another? Did he not give us all the instruction we can handle? If we were to go back and read the text and see what God told us to do. But moreover, he didn't tell us to do it and then leave us and say, well, y'all go figure it out now. This is not like when you got that piece of furniture in, in the house, that flat pack bookshelf that you need to put together, because there is no such thing as too many books. There's only not enough bookshelf space. <laughs> and they come, and they drop it off. The UPS driver drops it off at the door and then leaves. And you're on your own. Figure it out. That's not the life that God has given us. The Christian life is not... Ikea for spirituality. It's not even discount Ikea, also known as the Walmart version of it. You don't have to put it together yourself and hope that you guess right at the instructions. Well, I don't know. I can't tell from this picture, and there are no words. There are words. There are clear directions. But even more than that, the one who wrote them, the one who designed, is right there, present in our lives, present in our, our midst as a church, saying this is what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to be listening. God did not quit. And this is Luke's point here. The point here is that God didn't quit at the ascension. That's why Luke picks it up with the day of Pentecost, and from there on, it's constant action. Even when things go wrong, we see the Spirit of God at work in everything. That's why the book starts with a small group in an upper room and ends with a guy under house arrest in Rome. And yet, how does Acts end but that the Spirit of God is at work and the gospel's going everywhere? That is the point that we should take from all of this. Now, there are other sub-points to pick up. One of two traditions about the founding of the city of Rome is that it's founded by a guy by the name of Aeneas. And it's just kind of cool that we pick up on the fact that that's why one of the great Latin poems called the Aeneid. That tracks him from the end of, from the, end of the Trojan War to the founding of Rome. And I can make that much more boring if you'd like for me to, but let's just not, we'll go on. But this is a moment where it would be like as the gospel goes into a new place in America and you find somebody who comes to faith in Christ, his name is George Washington. It would just kind of echo neatly to you. You go, wow, this is cool. It's like a fresh start. If you were to find Abe Lincoln and lead him to Christ. God is at work in these things. God is at work in this person's life. And he's been paralyzed for eight years. Been stuck, trapped, unable to move. God heals him. Not through Peter planning to find him, but just Peter comes across and he does what good he can when he encounters somebody who needs him. Peter doesn't walk him through the whole committee process. Well, we've got to talk to the... Let me, let, me go, let me send and get permission from four other apostles. Let me check on this or check on that. Peter just looks at it and says, Jesus heals you. 
I think there's a sub point there for us to pick up that when we go and do good things in the name of the Lord, we need to make sure we do them in the name of the Lord. That we draw attention to Jesus and not to ourselves. That we draw attention to Jesus and not to any. Uh, now people are going to notice you. And believe me, if you walk in and heal somebody who's laying on a mat that's been paralyzed for eight years, people are going to not want to know your name. But as we do things, we ought to make sure that we point folks to Christ. That they will remember and know Him. And those who live around will hear, they'll see, and they'll turn and follow the Lord. We ought to be about finding those good works that we ought to do. And then, of course, we find that they sit that the that the church in Excuse me, the church of Joppa sends for Peter when Dorcas dies. And this has always been a little bit of a strange story because it's like, well, you know, if they knew that Peter could heal her, why didn't they send for him before she died? And we don't really know. This is one of those spots that there's not a whole lot of clarity. But it's possible that one of the things is that they saw her as one of the leaders of the church. And so they sent for Peter to say, hey, help us figure out who takes over. After all, one of the biggest challenges in the time in the life of a, of a local congregation is when you kind of have leadership vacuums. This is why we rejoice, for example, for our, our sister church here in town, First Baptist, that they have found a pastor to ask to come and help be a part of their leadership. It's why we continue to pray for North Cross at first as they're looking for somebody to, to hold that role. But we know they call for Peter, and I think that they get more out of this than they expected, because Peter doesn't just come and grieve with them. Instead, he comes, runs everybody out of the room, and raises her from the dead. Why? Because the Lord is always and continually at work through his spirit in the lives of his people. And it's not for us to push back and say, no, Lord, we don't want you to work in this person's life. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the message of the whole next chapter of the book of Acts. As you go through Acts chapter 10, it's going to be that, hey, nobody that the Lord calls to himself, nobody that God is at work in, should you say, I don't really think this person is worth my time. We tend to go to Acts chapter 10 about Peter's visit to Cornelius and we like to focus on the sheep that gets lowered down from heaven and, and God tells Peter to rise up and kill and eat and Peter, oh no I can't. The Lord says yes you can. Matter of fact you're better. I told you to. And we do like to go to that and say see this is part of what illustrates why bacon wrapped shrimp is an acceptable meal for the believer. <laughs> because if you were a good Jew you could not eat such things. Shrimp are bad, bacon's bad, it's just all bad. It's all unclean. But that's not the point. That's not what God gave us that scripture for. In fact, we could throw back to Jesus had already said, all foods are clean, don't worry about it. Rather, what we get from this is the important message that if God is at work in somebody's life, it's not even for somebody as important as Peter. Because at this point in the life of the church, in the book of Acts, there is no human being on earth more important in the church than Peter. And God sent him to go talk to one guy over yonder. Nobody is too important, is too insignificant. Nobody is too far away. Nobody is too far gone. That if God is at work in their life, that we get to say, no, not me. When you get to Peter and Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, you see that Cornelius is one of the leaders of the Italian cohort of the Roman army. Now, I am not a first century Israelite, first century Jew. I'm not involved in all of the politics of that era and of that time. Understanding all of those involves a stack of books this high. It's very fun to read. 
for some people. <laughs> like me. But I know this from it. There was not a good first century Jew who would have happily sat down with a member of the Italian regiment, the Italian cohort of the Roman army in the Middle East in the first century. They were political opposites. They were political enemies. The relationship between first century Jews and the Italians of the Roman army makes the animosity between Republicans and Democrats look like a friendly kickball match in the third grade. And when God sent Peter to Cornelius, he doesn't say, and while you're there, make sure he's clear that they should not be doing what they're doing in Jerusalem. He says, while you're there, make sure it's clear Jesus died for him. Make sure you understand, Peter, that he's my child. That I made him as much as I made you. That his family and his whole household is as worthy of my grace as you are. See, either we realize that God is at work in everybody all around us or we turn our backs on what Scripture teaches. Either we realize that the Holy Spirit doesn't stop working, that the Lord God Almighty doesn't stop working, or we have to ignore most of the Bible that we like. Mm -hmm. But nowhere in here do we get permission to trade this book in and say, well, we'll take the Bible up to here, and then from this far forward, we'll take How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Some of y'all remember reading that one. You were given that one as a high school graduation gift. We don't get to trade in principles and practices of business management. Trade it in and take the art of war. Trade it in and take you know, all sorts of these other things. How to affect a political victory. We don't get to trade in the Bible and say, well, we take the Bible to this point, and then from here forward, we just do our thing. You can't put the Bible down until the Spirit is no longer at work. Until that time. We might, in despair, say all we've got is the Word of God. <clears throat> but then again, what else do you need? Amen. All we've got is the Word of God. All we've got the message that the almighty creator of the universe who put all this together, who holds all things together, who will maintain all things and in some day will come and make all things new stopped at a point in time and said, you're worth my son's life. That's all we've got. All we've got is where God did that, and then he said, you're worth my son's life, and on top of that, I'm going to put you in a family of believers, not drawn together on the same tree, not put together in the same heritage book, not even all from the same city or town, but instead all brought together on the cross. That's all we've got. All we've got. It's the promise that whatever inflation does or doesn't do, inflation, deflation, stagflation, whatever else, yes, I've been reading economics books. You think it's bad now, you should have seen the 1890s. Whatever it does.
that not even Solomon in his splendor was ever dressed as today to the goodness and the beauty of the flowers that God throws out there in the field and then we cut down the salt of John Deere's and whatever else we have. <laughs> and that your father in heaven cares more about you than how those flowers look because they're not, they don't last. They're here today. Shredded tomorrow. A fire hazard by next week. And yet you are worth more than that. You're worth more than many, many sparrows. All we have is the word of God. Do you want? Oftentimes, the greatest folly of the church comes from thinking that we're supposed to get beyond. We're supposed to get to the point that, well, yeah, we've got the Bible, but then we've got this too. We've got this awesome program. We've got these, this amazing music, this amazing preacher, this amazing this. You know what makes everything in a church amazing or not amazing? It's not the charisma of the people that do it. It's not the talents. It's not the skills. It's whether or not it is empowered by the spirit of the living God. And you know what? That is very, very different than whether or not we would win on Star Search, America's Got Talent, or the Great American Preaching Contest. For the record, I have once entered a preaching contest and I did not win. So we've got that going for us. <laughs> because we don't have an award winning preacher. But I hope that as long as you let me do it, you'll have a preacher that preaches the word of the Lord. Because that's all we do. hold fast to that. Because as we do, I believe that we will see the Lord God work mighty, mighty things in our lives. You go back to the Exodus and it didn't have anything anymore. Children of Israel were in bondage. They were oppressed. They couldn't escape. They couldn't get away. They even lost their hope which was, hey, wait a minute. The vice regent of the, of, of the country is one of us. We have, maybe we'll have political, never mind. Mm -hmm. Moses did the, wrong thing, did, the, did the wrong thing in the wrong way, even though he thought his heart was in the right place. And that was it. There's no hopes left. All they had was God's promise. They didn't even have a boat when they needed it to get across the Red Sea. All they had was the word of the Lord. David had a rock against a guy with a helmet that was designed to repel the rocks. We ought not forget that when we tell the story of David and Goliath. Slingshot men were common in war and warfare in that day, and so the big guys had armor, and part of the design was to protect them from the rock. And yet the Lord God blessed because there was a promise. Nehemiah goes back to rebuild the wall to rebuild the city. I don't really have enough stuff. And the guy's a cupbearer, not an engineer. Not a carpenter, not a construction mechanic, not a project manager. He's not Scrum certified. He's not sure which building code to use, whether or not he's got OSHA certifications or anything else. And yet what he does have is the word of the Lord. Go do it. And the Persian Empire backs him up. The Persian Empire was not particularly friendly to anybody not Persian. 
And yet, all he had was all he needed. You go on and on. And so very often, the best of what we see in the work of the Lord comes from people who said, I don't have anything else. God is not taking a break between now and the second coming of Jesus. We sometimes act like it when he's not. He still empowers. He still works. He still moves. Let's put in the time of prayer and word that we would hear him speak. all we've got is the almighty God of the universe. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for bringing us this far. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to walk in obedience to you, to follow you well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.